And I'm going to begin with that same train, because I took that train, and that's where I'm going to start my story. So from Durban to Zimbabwe, that's Durban to Zimbabwe, the train journey takes three days. And it's a journey from the land of the Zulus, where, I'm, where my mother and I were both born. And it goes past Pretoria, where my father was born, and past Kimberley, where my grandmother was born. The train was segregated into two sections, whites and non-whites, separate and unequal, because apartheid was in force. And I was leaving South Africa and going to the new multiracial university in Zimbabwe where all people are equal. It was 1959, and in 1960, the Belgian Congo was scheduled to throw off the yoke of colonialism. And when it did so, I believed it would become a shining example of freedom that would inspire another shining example in neighboring Zimbabwe. During the 1950s, South Africa was isolated. Except for my immediate family, nobody I knew had ever traveled outside South Africa. There was no radio, no television to bring in new ideas. The privileged people, the whites, could read, and that they, but they mostly read one book, the Bible. And I couldn't imagine any way South Africa could move forward, and I felt unable to fit into this society, so I was leaving. The train passes my high school, whites only, boys only, surrounded by 10 sports fields. You can see what's important there, and I was glad to let that school pass behind me, and I hoped never to see it again, because I believe that all people are created equal, but it seemed to me that no one else shared my belief. Even among the privileged white boys, there was inequality, and bullying was used to preserve this inequality. And at the top were the rugby football players, and at the bottom were the boys who hid in the library. Now, as the train continues pa west past the gold mines and the diamond mines, the land becomes drier. The farms become poorer until eventually the train crosses the Limpopo River into Botswana. Here, the people who were able to work had left Botswana and had gone to South Africa the men to work in the mines or the farms, and the women to work as domestic servants. And those who were too old to work remained in this poverty-stricken land, together with the young children who were sent by their parents from, um, uh, to, sorry, sent by their parents from South Africa to be raised by grandparents in Botswana. And I blamed white South Africa for disrupting the traditional family life. It seemed that the faceless monster called apartheid had reached across the border from South Africa into Botswana, and I could see no way to break that cycle of poverty. And these migrant workers were not prepared for work in the mines or the cities or the farms the tools and appliances that were familiar to the privileged white children were unknown to Botswana men and women. And they had to be taught how to work these tools and appliances. And so these adults were treated as children. Now, it's easy to be scornful of the white people for this mistake. However, as my perspectives expanded, I began to see both the mistake and how easy it was to make this mistake if you lived in an isolated society where assumptions were not questioned. Sometimes it's difficult for a fish to see the water she is swimming in until she steps out of the water. 
And if you say that fish don't usually step out of the water, I will agree. <laughs> now, for three days on that train, I had time to read and reflect. And I was fortunate to talk with a psychology professor who believed that all people are equal. And he was trying to develop IQ tests to prove it. He explained to me how people are shaped by their life experiences and how all tests are culturally biased in ways that are not apparent to the people who are writing the tests. Once more, it's difficult for a fish to see the water she is swimming in. But now that I was stepping out of the water, I began to see how privilege had shaped me. I was carrying my privilege with me together with my implicit biases, and I began to see how we are all equal, but we need to look under the surface. And I tried to imagine how it would be if I had never been to a school, could not read, had never heard a radio, never seen a television or a movie, and I knew only what I was told by the people who lived nearby and who had never traveled outside uh, um, outside of Africa. Near the cities, the privileged people had been to drive-in movies. You needed a car to go to a drive-in movie, so privileged people. But most of the movies were American, so the white people believed that Americans carry guns and do not hesitate to use them. And the newsreels of the time showed dramatic scenes from the US civil rights movements and the South African whites compared these images of America with the South Africa they saw every day. And they judged their own country by their direct experiences, and they judged America by the movies and the newsreels. So the question is, are the movies and the newsreels a fair depiction of America? That they've certainly believed that they were. Now, as I talked to the psychology professor on the train, my mind went back to my father's farm. <clears throat> One Sunday evening, I was home alone when there was a loud banging on the door. And I opened the door to see a group of distraught women, and I recognized the wives of the farm workers. And Kassan, Kassan, come quickly, the men are killing each other. Now, Kassan means son of the boss. So, I was the Nkosan. And the women believed that I could do something, and I was not so sure. I, I was a teenager. I could hear sounds of fighting and shouting, but the moment I arrived, the fighting stopped, and everyone turned to me, a oh, good evening, Nkosan, and their body language was respectful. What's going on, I asked. He insulted my mother. He started it. He said bad words about my sister. And I felt I had stepped into a medieval village. This was not the way it should be in the 20th century. However, however the women were expecting, to meet, expecting me to do something, so I said what they expected me to say. Tomorrow's a work day and everyone must go to bed. Yes, Nkasan, and they went to bed. This is uncomfortable. <clears throat> I turned to the women and I said, no more drinking. And the women, empowered by what they believed to be my authority, gladly took away the alcohol and cleaned up the mess. Now, I had lived in Britain, where medieval society was a distant memory preserved only in books, and I wanted to move into the 20th century. And I respected these men, and I wanted to be their equals. But inequality permeated South Africa. So when a delivery truck arrived, delivering sacks of grain to the farm. My job was to count the sacks and sign the receipt, while the real men did the real work, carrying sacks on their heads. I wanted to work with them, and they were hesitant. But after showing me how to stand, OK, back straight, to avoid entering my back, they carefully lowered a sack onto my head, and I couldn't take a step for fear of breaking my neck. I was afraid that if I just moved a little bit, I would break my neck. So they removed the sack, and we all laughed together at the Unkasan who could not carry a sack on his head. 
and one man danced with a sack on his head and we all cheered. <laughs> they knew it was safe to laugh at me because my status and dignity were assured. However, I would never laugh at them because their dignity was fragile as a result of a lifetime of insults. Nelson Mandela talks of what he calls dozens of petty indignities every day. Now, if you add that up over a lifetime, it takes a toll. It changes people. It was the culture. Now, at my whites-only, boys-only school, the boys routinely insulted each other. They told insulting stories about girls. The boys' locker room culture was real men can take the insults, and if the girls don't hear, it doesn't matter. In contrast, the Zulu men fiercely defended the honor of their mothers and sisters and wives and girls because real men protect their women. My parents were tolerant of my ideas, although they didn't agree. During the Second World War, my father had served as an officer in the British Army where officers command and men obey. But he did believe, like Nelson Mandela, he believed in the importance of education and he favored expanding the South African education system. But being a practical man, he noted that it would require five times the number of teachers and five times the number of teacher training colleges and it would take time. My mother believed that the Zulus were different from the whites because they appeared to be different. And she had never met an educated Zulu, and she did not understand how education changes people. Now, I should add that my mother did change over time. She, uh, she did recognize and respect and admire Nelson Mandela, but that was later. <coughs> um, so, Oh, let me emphasize, I don't believe that educated means better, but I agree with Nelson Mandela when he said education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Education changes people. I could see myself in both of my parents, which was uncomfortable because as a teenager I wanted to break away. So I was glad to be on that train as it moved slowly through the Botswana wilderness. <clears throat> that was in the 1950s. In 1969, Kok Young and I were married, and we wrote to the South African authorities to ask if we could visit South Africa, and the answer was yes, but you will not be allowed to share a bedroom, because that is a violation of the apartheid laws. So we went to California, where the laws forbidding marriage between whites and Chinese had been struck down by the Supreme Court in 1967. America was changing. Now, <clears throat> in his Nelson Mandela again, in Africa, the seeds of change were growing in places that I did not see. Nelson Mandela received an education from Methodist missionaries, and he believed that the missionaries were a positive influence. He always believed in education, and he liked the missionaries. And Desmond Tutu, also received his education from missionaries. And with the support of these missionaries, he continued his studies in London. And in 1986, which is eight years before the end of apartheid, he became Archbishop of Cape Town. <clears throat> there he is as an Archbishop. In South Africa, as in most of the British world, the schools are associated with a church. And so when policies were changed, with the leadership of the Archbishop, thousands of teachers began to change society. Then in 1976, for the first time, television came to South Africa. 1976, that most of us remember television before then. The most popular TV show was The Cosby Show. Anyone remember The Cosby Show? All right. Um, and that was equally popular with whites and non-whites. And for the first time ever, all of the people in South Africa, whites and non-whites, saw 
that there was another way of living together. And that was an eye-opener to so many people. And then in 1981, my father wrote to say that South Africa was changing. Nelson Mandela summarized it well, I think. He said, the people in power sensed they were on the wrong side of history. And this change took a long time. And the member of parliament of my father's district assured him that Kokyung and I would be welcomed, so we booked our 32-hour journey to South Africa. And while we were waiting in the arrival hall, we heard an announcement, would the McNaughton family please identify which line you're in? So I raised my hand, and I saw an immigration officer hand a letter from the member of parliament to the officer at the front of our line. Privilege, this time based on our passports. At this time, Nelson Mandela was still in prison. It would be 13 more years before he was elected president. Apartheid was still the law, but it was no longer enforced. Non-whites were moving into white neighborhoods if they had the money to buy a house or pay the rent. Some of the white schools were accepting non-white students if they could afford the fees. <clears throat> Education, okay, there, that is my high school. That's the high school I went to. I recognize the school uniform. You could reasonably ask, why so few? Answer is because of the school fees. You have to pay money to get an education like that. Education earns money. Money buys education. Can we break this cycle? Kok Young and I met some white families who were paying the school fees for the child of a Zulu. I met a young Zulu boy who was going to my old school, and I was impressed. He was relaxed, confident, and he said he was enjoying school. Apparently, the cycle of bullying had been recognized and was being addressed by thoughtful policies. And I, now I could tell this story as good versus evil. They are bad, I am not like them. That's comforting, but I am like them, all of them, except I am more privileged. I see myself in the oppressed farm workers who had no privilege, I can also see myself in the white Africana farmers who had many privileges, but without two of the key privileges that I have, education and the English language. So I don't see the story of South Africa as a struggle of good versus evil. I see it as a story of a people, of many people shaped by different life experiences who eventually came to understand each other and reconcile. Now, in the United States, I also see deep divisions today. Can we reconcile? I think it's hopeless. But I thought it was hopeless in South Africa, and I was wrong about South Africa. Maybe I will be wrong again. May it be so. Thank you.